Well, good morning, Lansley Avenue. Well, good to see everyone. It's good to have uh, several visitors with us. Uh, we're glad you're here. I hope you'll come back each and every opportunity that you can. I will say good afternoon to our friends and family at uh, Knowles. We're coming out to see you this afternoon and so glad that you are now uh, part of us here at Lansley Avenue. Uh, I appreciate Mark leading for us this morning. When he woke up this morning, he didn't know he was doing that. Had to have a last minute substitution. So I appreciate his willingness to help us out. Uh, uh, sorry I had not led, put your favorite song in there, the Hallelujah Chorus, but uh, maybe, maybe next time we'll surprise you with that. Uh, the last song he led, Nearer Still Nearer, by the way, happens to be one of my favorite songs. Uh, when we do a fifth Sunday uh, sometime, I'm gonna make sure that's in there because I wanna talk about the words uh, where we've seen nothing I bring, nothing as an offering, Jesus, my King, only my sinful, now contrite, now realizing its mistakes apart, can I bring an offer. That's it. So I love that song. This morning, we're talking about the wrath of God. You know, we often usually don't want to talk about this, uh, but I want us to think about the wrath of God this morning, right? Usually talk about anything else other than anything on the, the harsh side of what may happen. The wrath of God. The passage we had read this morning, I appreciate uh, how we're reading that for us this morning, 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, 9, talking about the return of Jesus when God comes again, says, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord, Je of our Lord Jesus. First of all, stop right there. We, I think we can understand those that do not know God and may very well, of course, imply those that have never heard of Jesus. But I want to caution us. Uh, in the book of John, uh, uh, 1 John, we have someone say, if, if, if someone says, I know God, remember the passage? If I know God, but he hates his brother, he's a liar. So it's not merely those that have never heard the, the name of Jesus potentially in this. Individuals who say, I know God, I love God, I do what God wants me to do, but if we hate our brother, and we don't love our brothers and sisters, we don't seek to help them, we're lying. We don't really know God. And so I think that's included here in this passage. And those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, sometimes that's taken to mean baptism, and baptism is a part of that, don't get me wrong. But in some ways, a bigger part of that is changing your life from wrong to right. You can be dumped under some water and still living the way you did before, and you have not obeyed what God wants you to do. You haven't made a change. And so what happens to the, this, this group of people? And again, it's not merely those who've never heard the, the, the name of Jesus. They will suffer punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. They will not be in the presence of God forever. And we're told that that is a horrible, horrible thing. It sounds really awful. Well, it is really awful. So what do we know about the wrath of God? It's important to know about the wrath of God so that we understand what we really are facing in terms of our choice. So in the first place, God's wrath is provoked. All the way back in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 7, Moses says, Remember and do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day you came out of the land of Egypt until you came to this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. The children of Israel provoked God over and over in the wilderness for 40 years. It was as if they were intending to poke and rebel. They offended him. They provoked him all the time. And Moses here says, don't forget how often you provoked the Lord to wrath and to anger. So God's wrath is provoked. Deuteronomy 9.8, some of the examples Moses mentions after the previous statement. Even at Horeb, you provoked the Lord to wrath. And the Lord was so angry with you that he was ready to destroy you. Verse 22, at Teborah also, and at Massah, and at Kilbroth Hattabah, say that a few times, Kilbroth Hattabah, you provoked the Lord to wrath. Chapter 32, verse 16, they stirred him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations, they provoked him to anger. Verse 21 of chapter 32, they provoked me to anger with their idols. God's wrath 
is provoked by evil. Now, I know we know people that some things will provoke a response and some things won't. And sometimes if it's a brother or sister in a family situation, you're doing that on purpose. You're looking for a way to provoke them. Right? It's, it's part of how we learn to interact, I suppose. I, I freely confess I have done that more than once. But provoking God is not something we want to do. It's not something we want to leave unaddressed. Provoking God is a bad thing to do. Fortunately, God is slow to wrath as well. His wrath is provoked. Fortunately for us, probably the reason we are still here, God is very slow to actual wrath. Exodus 34 verse 6, God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger. His wrath will be provoked, his anger will be provoked, but he's very slow. It takes a long time before he's like, that's it. Numbers 14, 18, the, the Lord is slow to anger. Psalm 1 and 45, verse 8, the Lord is gracious and merciful and slow to anger. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? They're all pretty much saying the same thing. Nahum 1, 3, another quote from Nahum. We can talk about Nahum sometime. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. So God is not quickly provoked, for which we ought to be very, very thankful. But evil will cause God's wrath to come at some point. It will come. It just may take a while. Number three, God's wrath, as we said, is on the way. It is coming. Romans 1 verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against what? What's this wrath focusing at? Focusing on ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. It's coming from heaven and it's aimed at ungodliness and unrighteousness not living the way god wants us to live in chapter 2 of romans paul says but because of your hard and impenitent heart you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when god's righteous judgment will be revealed if i'm not living the way god wants me to live when god's righteous judgment is revealed i'm not going to compare remotely favorably to that now here's here's another aside as a hint None of us will on our own. The only way there's any favorable comparison to God's righteous judgment is the fact that Jesus' sacrifice will stand as our righteousness. On our own, none of us are righteous. We still sin. It's only through the sacrifice of Jesus, Jesus taking our place, that we have any hope on that day when the wrath of God is revealed. Colossians 3.16, 3.6 rather, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Paul says the wrath is coming because of these things. Well, what things? Go back to verse 5 and we'll see the different things that are generating God's wrath. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. The things that I do, the things that I'm involved in that are kind of base. They're kind of earthly. They're things that we do because we are human and we want to do what we want to do. What? Immorality. Impurity passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Most of those are centered around this vague idea, this more broad idea here of immorality. And I, we all know what that is. If it's, you think it might be immoral, it almost certainly is, right? Immorality and then idolatry. And I don't think many of us are actually carrying around little gold idols in our pocket this morning. If you are, please leave it at the front. We may burn, melt the gold down, it will help support things, you don't need an idol. It's not those kind of idols, but we have idols in terms of our future that we desire, success that we want, money, popularity. Some people have an idol in terms of the person they want to pursue. That man or that woman that they're in love with and are desperately trying to get, they put them in that place. Anything that takes the place of God, anything that will put us where we are focused on this thing, on this person, more than God, I would argue, is, is really what we're talking about here. Covetousness, wanting what other people have, desiring material things, that's idolatry. Any of those things are idolatry. Because of all these things, the wrath of God is coming. Notice he doesn't say it may come. He says it's coming. If 
Ephesians 5, 6, Let no one deceive you with her empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Right? The people who are disobedient, rather than the sons of obedience, the people, the, the daughters and sons of God who are living the way God wants them to, people that are just saying, I'm going to do what I want to do, those are the ones God's wrath is coming for. Romans 2, 8, but for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. That's a declarative statement. There will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil. So since it is coming, who's the object of this wrath? We've really been talking about it, but really, I want to focus and say once very plainly, Who's the object of this wrath? The wrath of God is coming on sinners. Romans 3.23, before you start thinking, well, it's these other people over here. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's always easy to talk about something where you can say it's those people over there. They're the ones that have problems with lying. They're the ones that have problems with greed. They're the ones that have problems with, you know, no one wants to ever talk about something that may include me, right? Remember, we used to have something in school, you'd have to draw sets on a piece of paper. And I, I'm not saying this was fun. The memory probably isn't fun either. But you'd always have like X over here and Y over here, and so two different groups. If I'm in X, I want to talk about Y. I want to talk about that other group over there. So sinners. If I'm thinking, well, I'm not a sinner, so I want to talk about that. Well, look what Paul says, Romans 3. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Left to ourselves, this is a pretty depressing picture. And this is the picture of humanity that God sees all the time and has ever since sin entered the world. If this weren't true, we, even as God's children, wouldn't sin. We all keep turning back to do the things we want to do. God's wrath is coming on sinners. What is it going to be? Well, sin leads to death. The wages of sin is death. You know, you go in, if you, if you work, you put in some hours, and for those hours, you expect to receive payment. And hopefully you get paid. You, you worked. This is what you deserve. You're going to get it because you work. Well, if we sin, that's like putting in hours at a job. And when we sin, we're going to get what we deserve. You work some hours, you're going to get the pay. You sin, you're going to get the wages. And this is not a good wage, it's death. Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is revealed, as we read already, against from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Sin is why the wrath of God is coming. God's wrath is coming on all of us, for all of us as sinners. But there is good news. If we ended it right there, it would be a horrible, horrible thought. But there's really good news. God's wrath was focused on the cross. It was focused on the cross upon which Jesus was placed. Colossians 1, 15 through 20. He, talking about Jesus right there, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. In him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him, still talking about Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things. God came to reconcile humanity to himself. We could not bridge the gap because of our sin. God sent Jesus to bring us back, to give us the opportunity to come back, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on heaven or on earth, how? Making peace by the blood of his cross. Without the blood of Jesus on the cross, there would be no peace, and the wrath of God would still have my name on it. It would still have your name on it. God's wrath would be coming for you. God's wrath would be coming for me. But Jesus made peace by the blood that he shed on the cross.
cross. The only way peace was possible with God, since we had rebelled and sinned against God, that's what sin is, it's rebellion. I don't care what you want me to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. It's rebellion was for Jesus to die in our place. Should have been me dying. For my sins, I should have been the one to die. Jesus had never sinned, and yet he put himself on that cross so that I wouldn't have to die. He made peace by the blood that he shed on the cross. Romans 5, 8 through 10, God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. All of us have sinned. All have sinned. No one does what's good. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It is God's love and only God's love that has placed, that placed Jesus on that cross while we were still sinners. It's not like Jesus came and died for the righteous. Remember what he said? I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And even those who thought they were righteous when Jesus was walking the earth really weren't. Jesus compares them to tombs that had dead bodies inside that were painted a nice white on the outside. Looked good from the outside, inside full of dead men's bones. That's what we all have been were it not for Jesus. How did Jesus dying for us change things? What did it do? How did it change things? Jesus' death did change things. Look again at Romans 5, 8 through 10. God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified, set right with God through his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him, through Jesus. The wrath of God is coming through Jesus' blood. We have the opportunity to be saved from that coming wrath. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, and we were, we were sinners. This gap was between us and God. No way we could close the gap. Jesus came, died, and brought us back to God, making peace with God. We have been reconciled, brought back to God. By his death, much more, having been reconciled, brought back to God, we shall be saved by Jesus' life. Therefore, having been justified by faith, understanding what Jesus did, believing in it, and acting on it, having been justified by his faith, we individually have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained, also have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace where we stand. We have peace with God through our faith in Jesus. God's wrath is not focused on his children. That's an important thing to remember. His wrath is not focused on his children. John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Look at the dichotomy, the split here. Whoever is one of God's children, whoever believes in Jesus, has life, has eternal life. But whoever does not obey the Son, whoever does not yield their life to the Son, the wrath of God remains on that person. Colossians 3, 6. Again, look at this. We talked about it already. For it is because of these things, the immorality and the idolatry, because of these things that the wrath of God is coming on whom? On the children of disobedience. It's not coming on the children of God. Ephesians 2, 13 and 14. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That reconciliation where Jesus reconciled us to God, Jesus made peace with God and brought us near to God. Paul in Ephesians said, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he, Jesus, he himself is our peace. He is the reason we can have peace with God. 
Now in Ephesians, the context is talking about Jew and Gentile. It works just as well. Very, very true talking about all of us being reconciled back to God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11. Paul here writing to the church of Corinth, the Christians of Corinth, says, Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Well, they're not because the wrath of God's coming upon them. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor those who are habitually drunk, nor verbal abusers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. I've said before, don't go picking one of these things out of this list to make that your rallying point. Being a sinner involved in any kind of sin will keep us separated from God. Sometimes you can imagine somebody wanting to focus on swindlers. You know, swindlers are not going to go home to live with God. Well, how about all the rest of the things that are going to keep people from going home to be with God? The only way to be home with God is to say, I know God and live the life you should knowing God. <clears throat> Doing these things habitually, being involved in these things instead of focusing on living with God will keep us out of the kingdom of God. It will. And look how he continues. Don't you know that all these things are going to keep people out of the kingdom of God? They won't, you won't inherit the kingdom of God if you do these things. And such were some of you. You used to be that kind of person. You know, I'm not asking for shows of hands in any way. For anybody in here about, were you a swindler? Were you a verbal abuser? Were you greedy? Whatever it may be. Certainly I'm not asking if you're involved in any of that today. But Paul says to the people in Corinth, some of you did these things. Did these things. You see the past tense? Such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you used to do these things, but you died to your old way of living. You turned away from your old way of living and you were washed. You were immersed in water to die to your old ways and you were raised up to be a brand new person. That's why you now have the hope of inheriting eternal life with God. You're not like that anymore. You're one of God's children now. Such were, I suspect, some of us. <clears throat> but we were washed and justified. Ephesians 2, 17, He, Jesus, came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. He brought a message of peace for all of us who know God and who live like we know God. So when you look at 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9, in flame and fire, the wrath of God is coming to inflict vengeance on those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The wrath of God is coming. The good news is that peace is offered through the death of Jesus who died for each and every one of us. I want to ask you a question. Are you concerned that the wrath of God may be coming for you? Are you living your life where you don't really seem to know God because you don't live like you know God? Have you obeyed what God wants you to do? Have you said, I am in fact going to die to the way I've been living and I'm going to be immersed so that I can show that I'm dying to my old way of living where God will forgive you as you raise or raised to walk as a brand new person? Beg each of us to make sure we think through that this morning. As I suggest we all come home to God today. As together we stand and sing.